So today we're going to go over respiratory. I would like to try to finish respiratory, but there's a lot of slides in respiratory, so we will probably spill over into uh, Friday as well. And then Friday I would like to begin GI. So I haven't completed the GI stuff yet, so I'll, I'll be posting that probably at some point tomorrow, at least part one of GI. So with that being said, did you guys get a chance to do all those endocrine uh, quizzes that I posted? You did? For a show of hands, who did them all? Oh, man, only a few of you? Good grief. All right, you plan on doing it, right? You plan on doing it. You better do it, all right, because you need to do those because I want you to do well on the exam, which is after Thanksgiving break, okay? So make sure you do those quizzes questions during your Thanksgiving break. So let's get into pulmonology. Um, what's up? We're going to do a review session on Wednesday, or we're going to cover some material on Wednesday, and then uh, we'll do the exam on Friday. Yeah, I don't like doing exams earlier in the week. I like to do them at the very end of the week. It's usually how I do it. Uh, yeah, there's going to be... Uh, I'd have to look over it again, so I'll, I'll clarify that on an announcement, what material is going to be on the exam. But yeah, I'll, I'll post that into the announcement. All right, so let's get into pulmonology. So for those of you who are fans of Sigmund Freud, such as myself, I like all the psychoanalysts. They're really cool, in my opinion. I like Freud. But I like Carl Jung better. But Carl Jung wasn't as much of a smoker as Freud was. Carl Jung did smoke a lot of pipes, which was pretty, you know, stereotypical for a lot of the psychoanalysts and, you know, intellectuals during those days. They'd be smoking their pipes. Freud had a penchant for, among other things, cigars. Uh, and that ultimately led to his demise. He, over time, developed oral cancer. After he developed oral cancer, he took his own life with a fatal dose of morphine. That's how he ultimately passed away. Um, for this class, we're not going to go into cancers. There's a lot of different types of cancers, especially ones that are linked to smoking. But we are going to talk about smoking-related diseases uh, later on in pulmonology. We're going to be discussing things like COPD as well as emphysema, and, which have a very strong correlation with uh, cigarette smoking, specifically cigarette smoking. Because with cigars, you don't really inhale them, puff on them, right? You don't really inhale them. If you do inhale a cigar, you can actually get pretty sick, <laughs> which I've, it's happened to me a couple of times. You get really, really queasy. I've actually thrown up smoking a cigar before. Um, pretty, pretty hilarious situation. I'm not going to go into the, the details for that. But <laughs> uh, with cigarette smoke, however, you do inhale that, right? And so cigarette smoking in particular is going to be uh, a huge risk factor for tons of different cardiovascular diseases. Um, so these are all the diseases that we're going to be covering for respiratory, um, some of which are going to be associated with, for example, cigarette smoke, like your COPDs, your uh, emphysema. Then we're also going to talk about other disorders as well, so things that might be associated with uh, infections, things that might be associated with uh, anesthesia and too much bed rest. So we'll talk about all these different conditions uh, momentarily. We're also going to talk about pneumonia too. And this is a famous illustration of uh, Stonewall Jackson, who was the leader of the Confederate South during the Civil War. And he ultimately met his demise when he contracted pneumonia. So hooray to pneumonia. <laughs> uh, anyways, <laughs> so signs and symptoms of pulmonary diseases. Um, dyspnea is going to be one of the major things. Dyspnea is effectively difficulty breathing. When you hear dyspnea, that is difficulty breathing. Cough. Uh, if a person's coughing, it could either be a dry cough or it could be a productive cough. If it's a productive cough, that means you're producing sputum. Right? And there's all sorts of different types of sputum. You can get just your regular run-of-the-mill kind of greenish, yellowish sputum, which is just basically purulence like dead neutrophils, dead bacteria, things like that. You could also have blood-tinged sputum, which would be, you know, you would see that pneumonia, so you would see like little streaks of blood within the sputum. You could see hemoptysis, which is like straight up coughing up blood. You especially see that with certain cancers as well as with tuberculosis. Right? If you have hemoptysis, you want to watch out for tuberculosis. That might be a dead giveaway for that. Um, altered breathing patterns, so 
Uh, you have all sorts of different types of breathing, right? You have Cheyenne Stout's breathing, you have Kussmaul's breathing, all sorts of different types of breathing. Hyperventilation and hypoventilation, pretty self-explanatory. We all know what that is. Tachypnea versus bradypnea. Tachypnea means it's too fast. The respiratory rates are above 20. Uh, bradypnea is below 12. Apnea, hmm, that's going to be uh, basically stopping breathing. So if you have sleep apnea, you're going to have periods where you stop breathing for a while, and then you're going to try to catch up. Right, your body is going to try to like go into a hyperventilation state. Hemoptysis, we just talked about that is blood in the sputum. You have different types of sputum, which we already went over. It might have different colors, like blood. You could also have malodorous sputum, especially with pneumonia. Clubbing is what happens to your fingers. So uh, clubbing, you get that with like prolonged hypoxia. So over time, you start getting uh, enlargement of your fingers. So I'll show you what images look like uh, for clubbing. So you have a couple examples of that later on. Cyanosis just means you're turning blue. If you have cyanosis, that means you have uh, severe hypoxia. So your lips, especially, you're going to see blue lips, blue ears, nose, mucosal membranes. Um, you can also get that on your fingers and toes. And then, of course, chest pain is going to be another thing you'll see in respiratory issues as well. Okay, so this is what cyanosis looks like. You can see it pretty marked on this person's lips and tongue. Um, this is what digital clubbing looks like. So you basically have enlargement of your digits. So that's what clubbing looks like. And so if you do a physical exam, that's what I put, put up there. This is one of the things you do on a standard physical exam. You just have the patient like put their fingers together, right? So if their nail beds are in contact with each other, that's normal. If you start seeing a widening angle at the nail beds, then that would be considered clubbing. Cyanosis versus clubbing. <laughs> Anyone seen this kid before? It's pretty hilarious. I forgot that I snuck that in there. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so that's not, that's not the type of clubbing we're talking about here. <laughs> I totally forgot I put that in there. Anyways, cough. <laughs> so cough. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, you can have uh, lots of different things that can cause cough. You can have dry cough versus productive cough. Uh, effectively, it's a reflex, right? You're trying to get stuff out of your lungs when you're coughing. So it could be due to allergies, right? Allergies can cause cough. It could be upper respiratory tract infections. That's what URTI stands for. You could have bronchitis, pneumonia. So those would be acute coughs, right? They last a short period of time. Versus a chronic cough, anything beyond three weeks is considered a chronic cough. Uh, what can cause that? You can get like COP, chronic bronchitis, um, allergies, asthma, a uh, person that has GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. My best friend gets this. Uh, he has to take PPIs, omeprazole, for his GERD. If GERD is severe enough, you get gastric acid, right? Hydrochloric acid starts irritating the throat, right? And so you start getting esophagitis. That can cause uh, reflexive coughing as well. And then, of course, cancer. And then there's ter tons of things that cause hemoptysis, which is coughing of blood. Uh, you can have infections, tuberculosis, right? There's going to be a hallmark. Uh, hemoptysis is a hallmark for tuberculosis. Um, if you have inflammation, cancers especially can cause uh, bloody sputum or hemoptysis. Spirometry and vital capacity. So pulmonary function test. This is revisiting your anatomy and physiology. Um, so this is what we're all doing right now because we're not just doing, we're not running or jogging or running away from a lion or something like that. We're just doing normal tidal breathing. Generally speaking, it's about 500 mLs of air with every breath that you take. Now, if you were to take a really deep breath in, fill your lungs all the way, that's going to be your inspiratory reserve volume. Then you breathe all the air out as rapidly as possible. You can get the forced expiratory volume within one second, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then you'll breathe all the air out, and then that would be your expiratory reserve volume. Uh, you're always going to have a little bit of air in the lungs. Why is that? Yeah, exactly. So otherwise, your alveoli will collapse. I don't know if that's what you said. I couldn't hear. Yeah. So if you did, if you breathe all the air out of your alveoli, your alveoli would get stuck together and it would collapse. Right. Um, 
you can uh, you see other animals that don't do tidal breathing like we do. We do tidal breathing. There's some animals that have like continual breathing. I forget what it's called, but like birds, like migratory birds. You know, they have like all these different like uh, air sacs without throughout their entire body, and they have continual breathing. So their their breathing is actually very e efficient. Right, so it allows them to like do long distance migration. But for us, we do tidal breathing. We always have to have a little bit of air left within the lungs. What was your question? Yeah, you would see that with atelectasis. You would see that with pneumothorax. Exactly. Yep. Um, and then the capacities. That's whenever you add up any of these vo values, right? So if you add up the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume, that's inspiratory capacity. Your uh, functional residual capacity would be expiratory reserve volume plus residual volume. Vital capacity is everything that you can breathe in and out, right? The maximum amount of air breathed out, the maximum amount breathed in, that's your vital capacity. And then your total lung capacity is all those values added up together. And here's another image of what that looks like. Tidal volume is usually about 500 mLs of air. Inspiratory reserve volume is over 3,000 mLs. Expiratory reserve volume. 1,000. Residual volume is really hard to measure. Um, you can, there's charts that will help you look at, uh, to calculate the expected residual volume. And it's going to be determined by the, the person's age as well as their gender, right? Because guys on average are a little bit larger than ladies. And so you'll, you can see charts online if you want to delve into it and nerd out on pulmonology. But I'm not expecting you to uh, be familiar with any of that. These are the different types of breathing that you can see. So eupnea is just normal, right? It's going to be normal breathing. Tachypnea, that just means you're breathing really fast. So accelerated respiratory rate. Bradypnea is slow. Hyperpnea uh, means that you're hyperventilating. So you're actually breathing in more uh, air. So you're increasing your tidal volume. If you have shallow breathing during hypoventilation, that's going to be reduced tidal volume. Then you have tachyp, uh, sorry, Kussmaul's breathing. We saw that with diabetic ketoacidosis. That's where you're breathing really, really, really fast, right? Because the lungs are now trying to compensate for the ketoacidosis, right? You're acidotic. It's a metabolic acidosis. The lungs are going to try to breathe off as much carbon dioxide as possible to bring the pH back up so they become alkalotic again. Alkalotic again. And then there's Cheyenne Stokes breathing. Um, this could be a person with sleep apnea, but it could also be a person who's comatose. Right. And so you would have these uh, moments where you stop breathing. Then you start breathing fast, 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 and slow it, stop. Then you breathe fast, 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 fast. Right. So uh, then you keep on doing that uh, cyclically. Let's watch a little video. So he stops, then he's going to slowly start breathing up again. So for this case, this is due to trauma, right? This guy probably got into some sort of accident. Maybe it was like a motor vehicle accident, and he's comatose. Um, but you could also see that with a person with sleep apnea as well. They would have a very similar breathing pattern. And so if you gave a person a CPAP machine, a CPAP machine is going to help like stabilize their breathing while they're sleeping at night. All right, let's move on. All right, now we talked about compensation before, right? We talked about compensation, especially when it has to do with like acidosis and things like that. So compensation is basically where you have your lungs coming in to allow for uh, changes in respiratory rate, heart rate. You might also have uh, vasoconstriction at the level of lungs uh, to compensate for whatever condition you might have. Whether it's too little oxygen or too much carbon dioxide building up. And if you don't get compensation taking place, if your lungs are basically not able to compensate, that's where you get acute respiratory failure as a consequence. Now, VQ, ventilation versus perfusion. Ventilation is V, and for whatever reason, I don't know why, perfusion is labeled as Q, 
Uh, maybe it's from Latin or something. I'm not really exactly sure. I should probably look into it. But ventilation is V. Uh, perfusion is Q. So what is ventilation? Ventilation is the airflow to your lungs. Right? So if you have normal airflow, that means you're breathing in oxygen, you're breathing out carbon dioxide, everything is nice and even and good. If you have like bronchoconstriction and reduced airflow, then you would start building up carbon dioxide. You would start re uh, becoming hypoxic as well. You're going to reduce your oxygen. On the other hand, if you have bronchodilation, like you're in a sympathetic state, you're jogging, exercising, um, running away from your pathology class as quickly as possible, you're going to see your bronchodilate, bronchioles dilate, and you're going to get more oxygen delivered, and you're going to breathe off more carbon dioxide. Perfusion has to deal with blood flow. And so if you had vasoconstriction, you would reduce blood flow. Vasodilation increases blood flow. There's also a thing that I didn't, I didn't put in here, but it's called uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. When you hear the term arrhythmia, what do you usually think? Yeah, an irregular or a bad heartbeat, right? A respiratory sinus arrhythmia is actually normal. Um, it's especially a mark of someone who's athletic, who's young, who has a good cardiovascular system that's functioning properly. Respiratory sinus arrhythmia, you can even do this to yourself if you're like taking your pulse rate. And uh, if you take a deep breath in, your heart is going to start pumping faster. As you breathe out, your heart slows down. And so that's actually normal. Um, that's your body's way of trying to match ventilation and perfusion. So when you're breathing in, you're getting oxygen into your alveoli. Your heart rate starts accelerating. It's going to pump more blood to your lungs. That's going to allow for maximization of perfusion, right? So you're going to have ventilation and perfusion being maximized with that. There's other th mechanisms come into play, like when you increase, sorry, when you decrease the interthoracic pressure, that sucks more blood back towards the heart. Bringing more blood to the heart starts increasing contractility, makes the heart beat faster. There's also stimulation of the vagus nerve, right? So if you breathe out, you're going to be putting more pressure on the vagus nerve. That's going to induce a parasympathetic state in the heart. It's going to slow the heart down. So when you breathe out, heart rate slows down. When you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. So that's normal. That is considered, that is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. I did not put that in this lecture slide, but you get the idea. So what if happens if you have a mismatch? So you might have a VQ mismatch. That means that the airflow is not equal to the blood flow for whatever reason. And there's a lot of things that can cause a VQ mismatch. First of all, uh, if you have a low VQ mismatch, you're going to get poor ventilation and decreased gas exchange. What are some of the things that can cause that? Uh, atelectasis, right? If you have a pneumothorax, right? That means that your lungs are now beginning to collapse. So that's what atelectasis means. You're having collapsing of certain portions of your lungs. Um, Asthma can also cause a VQ mismatch, right? Because with asthma, you're getting these mucus plugs that are forming within the bronchioles, and you're not able to get air moving properly. The blood is moving fine, but the air is not moving properly, so you get a VQ mismatch. Pulmonary edema, if you have too much inf uh, fluid accumulation in the lungs, right? You're not going to get enough gas exchange. Um, pneumonia and then bronchitis can also cause that too. Um, high VQ mismatch... Uh, where you have more airflow but not as much blood flow, that could be a pulmonary embolism, right? So if you get a pulmonary embolism that's blocking the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary arteries, then you're going to see less blood getting delivered to those specific parts of the lung, right? And so you're going to get airflow. Airflow is fine, but it's a question now of blood flow. Your blood flow is not going to be uh, moving properly. Um, you can also see a VQ mismatch deficit with conditions like emphysema, where you're having air trapped in the lungs because of decreased recoil. So here is a scan of a VQ scan. So this shows uh, a VQ mismatch. So this is a young girl who has shortness of breath and chest pain. It turns out that she has a pulmonary embolism. Don't ask me how a young girl got a PE, but she did. And so these are her lungs. This would be normal over here on B where you have both lungs getting perfused properly, this would be a VQ mismatch. So where you have 
normal perfusion, so this is the left lung right here, it's getting perfused normally, but the right lung is the one that was affected by the pulmonary embolism. So you're getting decreased blood flow to the affected lung. And so you're not seeing blood flowing properly. So what's going on with pulmonary embolisms? Pulmonary embolisms are a pretty scary uh, situation. Now, did I, get, did I tell you guys my pulmonary embolism story already? Like an old lady, like a Hispanic lady in her like 50s. All right, so I was working in the, was it cardiovascular? I think it was, I was doing like, I was working internal medicine at the time in one of my rotations. And there was this lady that I was supposed to go see. And I read her charts that said that she was in respiratory distress. She was, she had chest pain, right? So, you know, you think chest pain, respiratory distress, like this person could have like a heart attack, right? And so you want to make sure you work them up for a heart attack. And so I went in to go see the patient. When I was looking at her charts, it said, you know, she was, she was uh, tachycardic. Her heart rate was accelerated. Her blood pressure was accelerated. But her respiratory rate said 18. I was like, okay, the person's in respiratory uh, distress, but it says 18. So this is something that happens quite frequently when it comes to nurses. So you guys are all going to be doctors someday, right? At least most of you. So you're not going to make this type of... Uh, mistake. But nurses make this mistake quite often. So they'll go in because there are so many patients they have to go see. They'll get all the vital signs out the machine. They'll get the blood pressure. They'll get the temperature. They'll get uh, the heart rate. But then they'll just write 18 across the board for like all their patients. Because they don't want to sit there and like stare at the patient's chest for one minute. Because that's what you do. You have to look at the patient's chest for one minute and count the number of times they breathe within one minute. That's how you get a respiratory rate. And so... When I saw this patient, she was Hispanic at the time. Oh, my Spanish still sucks. But my, my wife is Mexican. You know, I'm, I'm learning. I'm still aprendiendo español. <laughs> but at the time, I really sucked at Spanish. So I was like, oh, uh, tu teño dolor. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, so yo, yo tengo dolor. Anyway, so that was the extent of my Spanish at the time. And so she had chest pain. And so, you know, it's awkward counting a person's respiratory rate, especially if you're a guy and your patient's a female. You have to stare at their chest for like one minute. It can be kind of awkward. But I had to do it because she was in respiratory distress. So I was like, you know, one thing that you can do is you can like take their pulse, right? And while you're taking their pulse, the patient's not paying attention. They think you're just taking the pulse. So you can actually like count their breaths while you're taking their pulse. So you can like kill two birds with one stone. So I was checking her respiratory rate. It was like 33. So really, really fast, really high. Like she was obviously in respiratory distress. And I was kind of freaking out. I was like, what's going on with this lady? You know, I don't think she has a heart attack. Because I looked at her EKG. It was not a heart attack. But there was a specific sign. And I should have put it in the lecture slides. There's like, if you look it up on Google, you can see like the specific EKG that's associated with pulmonary embolism. And I looked, I didn't remember it at the time. But I looked at it. I was like, this looks really familiar. I wonder what this is. And then I'm, with a little like, Google searching and thinking about it, I was like, oh, I think she has a pulmonary embolism. And lo and behold, that's what it was, right? The EKG was consistent with pulmonary embolism. The patient had chest pain. Um, and so I contacted my supervisors, and I was like, hey, I think this lady has a PE. So we ordered the D-dimers. We put her into a CT scan. And lo and behold, she had a pulmonary embolism, which is really dangerous. Like, if you have a pulmonary embolism and it doesn't kill you right away, like a saddle embolus, it could still progress and become worse and worse until it could eventually block all of the pulmonary arteries, uh, causing the patient to die. And I was a little pissed off at the nurse, and so I found out who it was. And so I pulled her aside, and I was like, hey, uh, by the way, this patient has a pulmonary embolism, and you wrote 18 for respiratory rate. That's not great because she had a respiratory rate of 33. The nurse like basically told me to shove off. <laughs> she, she actually got mad at me for calling her out. But like if the patient died, you know, like the patient, it, there could have been like an investigation to see like what the charts were looking like. You know, that could be a potential cause for, you know, malpractice, right? They didn't have all the labs written out properly and whatnot. So I always tell my nursing students about that story because, you know, they're going to have people's lives in their hands. So it's good to be alert to situations like that. So I think the patient survived. She, I think she did pretty well. They treated her with a TP, uh, TPA, so a clot buster, to, to break up the clot. So pulmonary embolism, you get uh, blood 
uh, thrombus that's going to uh, clot the uh, pulmonary arteries. What is the major cause of a pulmonary embolism? It's going to be DVTs or deep vein thrombosis. Now, how does somebody get a DVT? How does somebody get a DVT? We, we talked about DVTs already in this class. For, yeah, being sitting down for too long. Being pr like, so one of the common uh, stories that you're going to hear is, oh, I was on a really long trip. I was on a plane for like 10 hours or something. Or I was on a bus for a long period of time. Like, if you're traveling, it's a good idea to, like, stand up, move your legs around a little bit, because, remember, with your venous system, blood tends to pool, right? And so you don't want blood to pool, because when it pools, it coagulates. And so you have those one-way valves, right, that push blood back up towards your heart. So you want to move around, flex your muscles when you're sitting down for a long period of time. Um, so that's going to be one of the major risk factors is going to be DVTs. And if you see a patient with a DVT, it looks, it could look like cellulitis. You'll try to like gather the patient history a little bit. Like if they don't have like a fever and if they don't have like leukocytosis, then you're thinking it's a DVT. But it looks kind of like cellulitis. You have inflammation, redness of the leg. It's usually going to be unilateral, right? And so you could touch it. It's going to feel warm to the touch because of all the blood. It's going to be swollen and it's going to be painful. And so uh, Virchow's triad is going to be the risk factors, right? Damage, stasis, and hypercoagulability. For the ladies in this room, um, if, you're, if you or anybody you know is taking birth control, um, birth control plus smoking cigarettes is a huge risk factor for DVTs. Why? I have no idea, but it is. And so a person who's on birth control should not be smoking cigarettes because it can predispose them to getting deep vein thrombosis. What happens when you get a DVT? Sudden chest pain. Sudden onset, shortness of breath. Um, depending on how severe it is, you can get like cyanosis, syncope, which means that you pass out. Um, it's often asymptomatic if you have a DVT. Sometimes people don't even know they have a DVT. And then you want to do a test. You can run a D-dimer test, or you can run them through a, a fancy CT scanner. So it's a multi-detector computed tom tomographic angiography. And so this is what you would see on that type of CT scan. So it's a high re resolution CT scan, and you can see if there's a VQ mismatch. So this is normal, and this person over here that has a VQ mismatch is not proper uh, perfusion of the lungs it's because you're not having enough blood going to those areas. So this is a really massive uh, pulmonary embolism right here. Uh, here's another pulmonary embol embolism blocking one side of the lung. You can also see saddle embolus. Saddle embolus is really bad. You're blocking all of the pulmonary arteries. And that can definitely kill a person very, very rapidly. Right? You're not getting any blood to the lungs whatsoever. All right, let's switch gears now and talk about obstructive versus restrictive diseases. Obstructive disease, uh, disease means that you're trapping air in your lungs. You're not able to get the air out of your lungs. And there's a couple diseases that fall under that category. Uh, COPD, emphysema, and asthma you get air trapping. Emphysema especially, right? You're going to destroy the elastic tissue in the alveoli. The lungs become hyperinflated, and you're not able to push the air out of the lungs. And so you have air trapping. So you have lots of air in the lungs. So you're going to have a really large total lung capacity because you have lots of air in the lungs. So your lungs are going to be enlarged. If you were to do a x-ray on that patient, you're going to see it looks like a barrel chest. They have like a really large chest because of all the air that's getting trapped in there. Forced expiratory volume within one second. That's what FEV1 is. So that means they take a really deep breath in, then breathe out as quickly as possible. If the air is getting trapped, they're not going to be able to push out the air as quickly as possible. Right? The air is going to move out of the lungs very slowly. And so the amount of air is going to be reduced for your FEV1, so it's less than 80%. Um, what else is going to be different, uh, different here? You're going to have the ratio of your uh, uh, forced expiratory volume and uh, your functional vital capacity is going to be less than 70%. So that's going to be the ratio of the forced expiratory volume versus functional uh, vital capacity. What's going on with restrictive disease? 
So res restrictive disease, you're having a hard time filling the lungs to begin with. Right? Think about it as being like a really tight balloon that you're trying to blow, in, blow air into it. And it's really tight. You're not going to be able to get as much air into there as possible. And so you have decreased compliance. So your total lung capacity is going to be reduced as a consequence. The FEV1 uh, is also going to be reduced because you're not going to have so much air in the lungs to begin with. So you're not able to actually breathe it all out. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Pulmonary fibrosis. That's going to be one of the major causes of uh, restrictive disease. Obesity, right? You have lots of weight and pressure on the lungs. You can't get it out. If your lungs collapse due to like atelectasis, that could be one cause. Um, bronchiectasis, which is where you have like enlargement of the bronchi and a bunch of mucus plugs blocking the airways. Um, pulmonary edema, and then acute respiratory distress syndrome. We're going to talk about ARDS later on. So those are all the things that can cause restrictive lung disease. And so this is your FEV1, and then the forced vital capacity, that's FVC. So this is the amount of air that you can blow out in one second, right? So you blow out as quickly as possible, and then with one second, that's your FEV1. The forced vital capacity is where you go even further than that, right? So with obstructive airway disease, where you can't get the air out, FEV1 is going to be markedly reduced. You're not going to be able to blow out a lot of air in your FEV1. Your forced vital capacity, also, you're not able to blow out as much air as possible because it's all trapped in your lungs still. Then restrictive lung disease, uh, you're going to be able to blow the air out kind of rapidly, but it's, you know, it's, uh, there's not much air in the lungs to begin with, right? So it's going to be still pretty low. Your for, uh, forced vital capacity is also going to be low, right? Because you're not able to get air in the lungs much at all to begin with. So these are all examples of air trapping. Obstructive disease versus restrictive disease, where you have decreased compliance of the lungs. Now, asthma. This is one of your obstructive conditions, right? What's going on with asthma? You get dyspnea, coughing, wheezing. You're going to get stuff accumulating within the bronchioles. So you get mucus plugs. Um, you also get irritation of the bronchial lining as well. What are the things that cause asthma? Um... So allergies, it can be a seasonal thing, right? During fall, during spring, you can get increased triggers for asthma. Temperature changes, especially with cold air. Cold air can cause triggers for asthma. People who are exercising sometimes can get an asthma attack. Does anybody in here have asthma? Wow, there's a lot of you. So what are the triggers for your asthma? Which one? The weather, so cold air. You too, cold air. Allergies, allergies. Anyone get exercise-induced asthma? You do? Do you guys have to use rescue inhalers, albuterol? How often do you have to use them? During the winter, a lot? Like once a week or so? Every other week? Okay. Same thing? Yeah? Do you guys have to take corticosteroids as well? So you guys don't have severe asthma. You have like pretty mild to moderate asthma. Because severe asthma, you also have to take like corticosteroids so you can re reduce inflammation. Um, and then some really severe asthma are folks that get like an asthma attack multiple times per week. Sometimes they'll get hospitalized. Have you guys ever been hospitalized for asthma before? You have? Yeah. You have? Yeah. Are you, do you still have asthma? Yeah, some people have asthma in their youth. And as they get older, sometimes the asthma goes away. So that... I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. It might have to do with, like, you have reduced sensitivity to things, like maybe pollen, maybe you have reduced sensitivity to cold. But other than that, I really don't know why. But, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, some people can overcome it. Um, <clears throat> so these are all the things that can cause asthma. <laughs> Strong emotions. That's a funny one. So what's going on with asthma? You get hypersensitivity. Um, you get irritants that are causing mucus plugs. Uh, how do you treat it? Albuterol is going to be one of the major treatments. What receptors do albuterol attach to or does albuterol attach to? It's going to be your beta-2 receptors. Um, you're going to see beta-2 receptor activation that causes bronchodilation, right? And so it increases the size of the bronchi or the diameter of the bronchi. There's also 30% of the receptors on your heart are going to be beta-2 receptors. Heart is mostly beta-1, right? but there's also beta-2 receptors on the heart. 
when you guys take your albuterol, do you start feeling palpitations in your heart? Because I've had students that say that when they do their albuterol. It starts to race a little bit. Yeah, so I had a, I had a student who, it like clicked. They're like, I had no idea why my heart starts racing. and pal Like I feel the palpitations. And that's because you also have beta-2 receptors on the heart, too. It's mostly beta-1, but some beta-2. And then these are all the other things you can take if you have more severe asthma. You can take corticosteroids. You can take all these other drugs. I'm like, I'm not going to test you on these. But. And then here's uh, a nice little chart that talks about the different receptor types. So here's a beta-2. You get bronchodilation. <clears throat> Moving on. Oh, actually, we skipped the video. Let me, uh, let me pull this up here. These are the sounds that you hear with asthma. If you're going to do a auscultation with your stethoscope. So that's wheezing. All right, so you guys get the picture, right? So those are the different types of sounds you'll hear in varying degrees of asthma. And then let's watch another little video here that talks about asthma in more detail. You know what? That's a long video, five minutes. You guys can watch that on your own, right? Unless you want to have a little movie time. No? You want to move on? All right, let's move on. <laughs> it's a good video, though. It's uh, one of those uh, TED Talk videos, which is very, very nice. Good uh, illustrations as well. Um, lots of people have asthma. Lots of people. This classroom, this is the most number of students have had that have as, have had, had has Jesus that have had asthma in one classroom. That's pretty amazing. Usually I have like one or two students, but there was like five of you in here. That's pretty amazing. So it's very common. Lots of people have it. You get the thickening of the airways, right? That's why it's causing the narrowing. You also get those mucus plugs, and then you also get those bronchospasms. And that's why I use albuterol. It's going to help with those bronchospasms. And we're not going to watch that video because it's too long. What are the triggers? We already went over those. But to reiterate, allergens, irritants. Uh, you can also get infections that can cause it too. Wheezing, tight chest, hyperventilation, dry cough. Um, what is the pathophysiology behind asthma? It's going to involve histamine, right? So mast cell degranulation, it's going to be associated with your immunoglobin uh, IgE, and that's going to cause edema, narrowing. It's going to cause secretion of mucus, forming a mucus plug, as well as narrowing right, of the bronchioles. How do you diagnose it? You could do spirometry, pulmonary function test. Right? Those things are all going to be able to help you diagnose asthma. Um, and then how do you treat it? You can take your bronchodilators. Beta-2 agonists like albuterol, steroids, and then just avoiding all of those triggers. Triggers such as pet dander, <laughs> uh, cockroaches. Yay, cockroaches can trigger asthma. Dust mites. Um, yeah, all those things. So you want to avoid all that if you have asthma. All right, let's move on now to uh, infections. So this is some like bread and butter stuff. Right, you're going to see lots of respiratory infections. We're not going to cover like the, the whole entire breadth of infections, but there's a ton, right? Especially when it comes to upper respiratory infections. Upper respiratory infections are super common, especially like around this time of the year, right? When you have the change of the seasons, 
you have we're in cold and flu season right now. So if you were working in the hospital, you would see lots of patients coming in with different types of URIs. But once you get below the level of the larynx, right, because the larynx is the border between upper and lower respiratory tract, then you're going to start getting into lower respiratory tract infections. Bronchitis is going to be one of those. Bronchitis, generally speaking, is going to be a viral infection. Um, how do you treat viral bronchitis? You can get, yeah, don't give them antibiotics, right? You can give them albuterol. You can give them albuterol to help them breathe better. But in reality, all you're really going to do is supportive management, right? So make sure that they get plenty of fluids, all of that, right? You can take, you know, uh, drugs to reduce the fever if you have a fever, but that's about it. You don't want to give them antibiotics. Uh, and so what you're going to see with uh, bronchitis, it's going to be... Uh, Bilateral, bronchi, crack, crackles. If you have a bacterial infection, it's going to be usually due to Bordetella pertussis. So you can treat that with antibiotics, but otherwise you're not going to treat bronchitis with antibiotics. So let's hear what bronchi sound like. So these are bronchi. So you get the idea, right? So it's going to be a uh, disturbance of breath sounds on both inspiration as well as expiration. And then let's hear what crackles sound like. Crackles are kind of like crepitations. Is there a crackles or a coarse crackles? I wanted to think fluid in the airways when you hear crackles. Is that what you're saying? Positive crackles can be from basically any sort of fluid or mucus that is built up in the airways. You hear that cracking sound as the air passes through that fluid or mucus filled area. You can hear these in all All right, you get the idea. <clears throat> All right, like I said, generally it's going to be a viral infection causing bronchitis. It could be any of these like coronaviruses, rhinovirus, influenza, adenovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, which I'm pretty sure I had last year. It was really awful. I was sick for like a week and a half, almost two weeks with this damn thing, but it was really uncomfortable. So I had like a little bit of a bronchitis going on there. Um, bacterial, again, Bordetella pertussis, and that would cause whooping cough. So that would be the bacterial form of bronchitis. So generally speaking, you're going to get fevers and chills. You're usually not going to see any productive cough unless it's bacterial. Um, and then you'll get chest pain from coughing. Uh, chest x-ray is not going to look too dramatic on a patient with bronchitis. You could do a pulmonary function test. You could just look at, do a physical exam on the patient, just like list, do auscultation of the different lung areas. How do you treat it? Because it's, uh, because it's viral, you don't really do much, right? You can give them, like I said, uh, albuterol inhaler. You can do a humidifier if you want. You can give them codeine to suppress cough. If it's bacterial, that's when you give them uh, antibiotics. Now, what's up? Croup. Yeah, croup is the barking, the barking seal cough. And croup is going to be different than uh, bronchitis. I'm trying to... Homophilus influenza, if I remember correctly. Did you have... You've had croup? Did you... You didn't do the barking seal cough? No, no. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's croup. That's also something that you usually don't really treat, except for with corticosteroids. So with corticosteroids, you reduce the inflammation. And yeah, 
Yeah, so my best buddy, his kid, he was telling me that he was on the phone because he always calls me with, like, doctor. He's like, I'm like his doctor. I'm like, dude, go see a doctor. <laughs> like, don't, don't call me up about this type of stuff. But he's always, he doesn't want to go deal with insurance and doesn't want to deal with it yet. I get it. So he called me. He's like, should I be worried about my kid? He's like, got this really weird cough going on. It was croup. It was like barking seal cough. And so I heard his kid coughing over the phone. I'm like, oh, dude, that's croup. Um, you should get him treated. You should take him to the doc so he can get at least corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation. But like you said, usually you don't really have to do much else besides that. You could do like a humidifier that can help. But yeah, and it's, it's self-limiting. It's usually a viral infection that causes that. Haemophilus influenza, if I remember correctly. I think that's the one. Or no, it might be para-influenza. I can't remember exactly what causes croup, but yeah, that's the one that causes a barking seal cough. Good question, though. COPD, so this is chronic bronchitis or emphysema. So chronic uh, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's what COPD stands for. It is very, very, very common. Lots of people have COPD. Um, it is usually associated with smoking cigarettes. Okay, So COPD is generally associated with cigarette smoke. So you're going to get chronic uh, bronchitis. Um, hmm. Asthma is also a chronic disease if it's over three months. Right? You get obstruction. But asthma is not COPD, so do not get those confused with each other. Okay, so here's your COPD. So you have your chronic bronchitis versus emphysema. And so these are the two major types of presentations you'll see. You'll see the blue bloater or the pink puffer. With a blue bloater, the person is going to be cyanotic, so they're going to be kind of blue. Um, they're also going to have edema. They're also going to have elevated hemoglobin to try to compensate for the uh, hypoxia that they're experiencing. Versus patients with emphysema, they're going to look kind of cachectic. They're going to look kind of like wasting away. Um, they're going to have a barrel chest. So if you look at their chest radiograph on an x-ray, you're going to see enlargement of their thorax. So they're going to have barrel chest. And they're going to be pink because of hypercapnia. So let's go through each of these. So COPD. Major cause is going to be cigarette smoke. So back in the day, doctors apparently, according to old advertisements, used to prescribe cigarettes to people, right? It helps you breathe better, you know? Yeah, we don't do that anymore nowadays. So don't, you know, if you, smoking is a, a bad habit. Don't smoke cigarettes. It's expensive. They're really expensive, and then they kill you. Cigars, on the other hand, you know, I, I like cigars, but <laughs> cigars are expensive, but it's not like you're uh, smoking down uh, stogie like every day. You know, cigarette smokers, sometimes they'll smoke like one pack, two packs. God, I've, I've even heard of some people smoking like four packs a day, and that's absolutely insane. Once you get to about a 20-pack year history of smoking, the way you calculate, you're going to hear when you go out into like the working with patients, oh, so -and -so, patient X has a 20-pack year history of smoking. 20, uh, let's think about how this is calculated. You take the number of cigarettes in the pack. There's usually 20 cig cigarettes in the pack. If they smoke one pack per day for 20 years, that's a 20-year pack history of smoking. If they smoke two packs a day and they do that for 10 years, that is also considered a 20-pack year history of smoking. If they smoke one half a pack for 40 years, so 10 cigarettes a day for 40 years, that's considered a 20-pack year history of smoking. So there's like a little equation that you can use to calculate that out. But generally speaking, it's one pack per day, 20 cigarettes for 20 years. That's going to be like the standard metric. And then depending on how many packs they smoke a day, if it's like two packs versus a half a pack, then you can calculate the pack uh, history. 20 years of smoking cigarettes is when you start to see things happening, like COPD, increased risk of cancer, things like that. Um, it's reverse. Some of these things are reversible, though. If you tell a person to stop smoking cigarettes and they do quit, which is really hard to do. Like my best friend, he's he has quit smoking now, I think, six or seven times in his life. So, yeah, right. He quits and then he goes back into it again. He does like nicotine pouches. He actually gave me one of those and I, I felt really sick. They're like really they get way too much nicotine. And so he, he tries to do nicotine pouches. I think he's done the nicotine patch and the nicotine gum, but nothing really helps. So he is now, again, back at smoking cigarettes. So no, not good. So anyways, so COPD, 
major cause is going to be smoking cigarettes. You can also get that from other things too, like silica dust. If you're welding a lot, the fumes can cause COPD. Coal dust. So we're going to talk about black lung a little bit later. Uh, pneumoconiosis. That's one of the major causes of work-related uh, COPD. You can also have patients that have a deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And alpha-1 antitrypsin is going to be something that protects the elastic tissues in the lung. If you don't have that, the elastic tissues are going to get destroyed. So patients that have an anti, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency will eventually develop uh, COPD or emphysema. So what's going on with COPD? You get chronic bronchitis, right? So you're going to have lots of mucus production. You're going to have a persistent cough that's chronic, right? And again, smoking is going to be the major cause of that. Um, and so blue bloaters, that's where you get edema, cyanosis. The person might be obese as well. They're going to have shortness of breath. They're going to be wheezing. They're going to be hypoxic. So they're going to be cyanotic. That's why they look blue, right? They have cyanosis. Um, they're also going to have clubbing. So if you look at their fingers, you're going to see that increased angle if you put their uh, fingers together, increased angle at the nail beds. Something else that could happen, too, is core pulmonale, right? So if you have core pulmonale can be a si side effect of a lot of different pulmonary diseases. So like pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension. Eventually, it's going to cause core pulmonale, which is right-sided heart failure, where the right side of the heart becomes hypertrophied. Then you get the increased jugular venous distension on the neck, right? So you see the jugular vein actually pulsating, which you're not usually supposed to see happening. So anyways, those are all the things you see with COPD, especially with blue, uh, blue bloaters. How do you diagnose it? You could do pulmonary function tests. You can check their x-rays. How do you treat it? You tell them to put the smoking down, put the cigarettes away, stop it. Uh, you can have them do uh, bronchodilators like albuterol. Uh, and then you can, of course, give them oxygen as well. So here's kind of like the pathophysiology behind uh, chronic bronchitis. You get narrowing of the airways. You get lots of mucus secretion, right? You're going to get goblet cells. are going to be hyperactive. That's why you get that productive cough. Uh, if you impair your cilia, you paralyze the mucociliary escalator. Tobacco smoke does a really good job at that. It paralyzes the mucociliary escalator. So guess what? You're getting stuff like bacteria remaining within the lungs. The mucociliary escalator beats in one direction out of the lungs, so you can like get stuff to get removed with cilia. But if you paralyze the cilia, you're, you're going to have an increased risk for infection. You get the air trapping. That's why it's obstructive. Hypercapnia, because you're not getting good ventilation, right? And you're hypoxic. You become acidotic. You get the clubbing because of hypoxia. You get polycytemia which is because your kidneys now are going to try to compensate. They're going to try to compensate for the, um, the hy hypoxia. So they're going to produce more red blood cells. They're going to have more hemoglobin, more red blood cells because of erythropoietin. And so you're going to have polycytemia, which can increase your risk for stroke as well as uh, other things. Because if you have lots of red blood cells, that makes your blood more viscous which makes it hypercoagulable. So you can have an increased risk for stroke and heart attack because of that. And then we talked about uh, core pulmonale. If you have right-sided heart failure, that means now you're just going to start getting systematic edema, right? especially in the lower extremities. You're going to get pulmonary edema. So these are all the things that you'll see with chronic bron bronchitis. So make sure you're familiar with all of the stuff that you see over here that's highlighted with the little blue stars there. Now, on the other hand, you have emphysema, which is going to be a little bit different. The major mechanism of emphysema is breakdown of elastin or uh, trypsin. So if you break down the elastic fibers, that means the alveoli no longer can recoil. And if they can't recoil, then the air gets stuck within the lungs. And so that's going to be the major mechanism there. So a person could be born with ant or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, that's going to cause destruction of the elastin because neutrophils actually go in and release uh, 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 things to break down elastin from bacteria, but it also affects the elastin within the lungs. So if you don't have this anti-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which would otherwise 
inhibit neutrophils to destroy elastin, then neutrophils are going to go hog wild and destroy all the elastin within the lungs. And the other type would be just secondary emphysema from smoking. You get pink puffers because the person is pursing their lips. So they're going to be tripoding. Right? If you tripod, it kind of helps you breathe a little bit better. Then they're going to be pursing their lips when they breathe out. Now, uh, I'm not really big into physics at all, but there's some physics that goes behind like breathing out of a narrow opening. And so when you breathe out of a narrow opening and you have a lot of air trapped in your lungs, it helps to allow the air to come out easier. So you, it facilitates exhalation. Whether at, uh, whereas if you try to breathe normally and you have lung or air trapping, the air doesn't come out easier. So I don't know the physics behind it too well, but it has to do with narrow opening, allows the air to come out with more ease. What's up? That's probably... Yeah. It could be. Yeah, it could be part of that. I don't honestly really know the, <laughs> the full-on mechanism behind it. That's more like physics. <laughs> and I hate physics, so we're not going to go into that. But just know pink puffer, pursing the lips, okay? Um, they're going to get dyspnea or shortness of breath, right? difficulty breathing. Barrel chest is going to be one of the hallmarks of emphysema. Um, they're going to have lots of carbon dioxide, so they're going to be hypercapnic, and that is going to make their skin look pinker. And so hypercapnia makes their skin look pink, and they're going to be pursing their lips to breathe out. Again, you can do a pulmonary function test. Um, you're going to see flattening of the diaphragm. That's going to be part of that whole barrel chest uh, presentation. They're going to be hypercapnic, and um, but they're not going to be cyanotic. They actually have a VQ... Uh, their VQ is actually going to be matched properly. Treatment, again, tell the person to stop smoking. Easier said than done, right? Uh, you can give them bronchodilators like albuterol. So here's a whole chart that talks about trypsin. So trypsin is uh, the elastase that's produced by neutrophils. So if you smoke cigarettes, you can actually wipe out that alpha-1 antitrypsin. This also happens if you have an anti I'm sorry, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So this whole pathway will be very similar. So what happens? If you can't inhibit the neutrophils from releasing elastase, which breaks down elastic tissues, they're going to destroy bacteria, which is a good thing. That's what neutrophils do. But the neutrophils are also going to affect the trypsin within the alveolar walls. And so you're going to break down the elastic uh, tissues, which is not a good thing. <clears throat> so here's your elastin, which is trypsin. It breaks down the lung tissues. Uh, macrophages uh, release trypsin, also uh, neutrophils. Lungs, uh, they're usually going to be protected by the al anti one, sorry, alpha one antitrypsin. But if you break down the alpha one antitrypsin and you can't prevent the breakdown of elastase, then uh, elastase is going to destroy all the elastic tissue in the lungs, and that's going to be uh, mostly due to the neutrophils. Smoking, of course, oxidative stress, that's one of the major mechanisms where you see destruction of the lung tissues, and you get air trapping, capillaries get destroyed, so you have zero le less perfusion, less ventilation because of the alveoli. Um, but for whatever reason, you're not going to get cyanosis, right? The airflow and blood flow are going to be equally affected. So you don't get cyanosis, but you do get hypercapnia. That's why you become pink on your color. So barrel chest, dyspnea, um, they're going to be in a hypermetabolic state, which is why they get uh, cachexia, or cachexia, wasting away, and weight loss, and then they're going to be hypercapnic, causing pink skin. So this is what emphysema would look like. See, so look at the diaphragm. It's nice and flat. That's going to be part of the whole barrel chest presentation. The lungs are massive compared to normal lungs, so increased size and flattening of the diaphragm. Those are the hallmarks of emphysema. So pursing of the lips, this is kind of what's going on, releasing the air that's trapped in there. It reduces the work to breathe, prolonged exhalation, slows the breath rate, improves breathing patterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's watch a little video on pursed lip breathing. Again, they don't go into the physics behind it. They just, you know, kind of talk about what's going on.
What can a patient do to be rid of shortness of breath? A breathing technique known as personal breathing can help an emphysema patient get rid of more carbon dioxide, thereby helping to ease the sensation of dyspnea. When a patient uses personal breathing, they inhale through their nose and exhale through pursed lips. And exhaling through the pursed lips creates a slight back pressure into the lungs, which helps split or hold those airways open. When the airways are held over longer, more of the carbon dioxide can come out. The patient learns to breathe in to a count of two through their nose and out to a count of four. Kind of like on the road and blow out the handle. Counting into two and out to four helps slow down the patient's rate of breathing and it helps control their breathing cycle. So if the airways are held open longer and they'll get rid of more of the carbon dioxide, thereby being able to breathe in more oxygen. Some patients actually practice this by blowing bubbles or blowing on a pinwheel. It's important to practice this technique so it becomes second nature. This will allow the patient to use personal breathing without even having to stop and think about it. Isn't this type of breathing also used as a relaxation technique? Yes, it is. Due to the regularity of the breathing pattern, it is very relaxing. It is actually the type of breathing that is taught with yoga and meditation. Thank you for being with us today to explain first lip breathing. All right. <laughs> Anybody else really annoyed by her lisp? <laughs> Makes my skin crawl a little bit. All right, so here's the things that I want you to definitely keep in mind when it comes to emphysema. So you get hypercapnia, so that makes you pink. They're going to purse their lips, so they puff. <laughs> Air gets trapped. They get the barrel chest. Oh, hyperresonance, too. Like if you were to do the percussion, right? So you're going to tap on their chest, you would hear hyperresonance on percussion. Um, they're going to be very thin, right, because they're hypermetabolic, so they're going to be wasting away a little bit. So those are all things associated with uh, emphysema. All right, any questions on COPD versus emphysema versus asthma? All right, now let's shift gears and talk about uh, restrictive lung diseases. So this is just a diagram that shows um, how breathing takes place, external ventilation right, at the level of the alveoli, uh, which are exposed to the atmospheric air, right? And at sea level, your atmospheric pressure is going to be 760 millimeters of mercury. And that's one ATM. That's one atmospheric pressure. Okay? So within your alveoli, um, in order for you to breathe in, right, you guys remember Boyle's Law from AMP? So, <laughs> so with Boyle's Law, it's, uh, there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. As you increase the volume of a given space, you're decreasing pressure. So if you decrease the pressure, uh, your intraalveolar pressure below 760, if it's like 758, if it's 755, 750, now air is going to get pushed into the lungs. And so that's the mechanism behind that. This is your uh, interpleural space, and the interpleural pressure is always negative. You do not want the interpleural space to have a positive pressure in there. If you do, that's a bad situation. That means that you have like a pneumothorax, right? So that's not good. You might have a hemothorax. You might have something that's like taking up space now in that interpleural space, and that's not a good thing. So it's supposed to be uh, negative pressure when compared to the interalveolar pressure. Um, so let's move on here. So what happens with pulmonary fibrosis? Basically, you have decreased lung compliance. The lungs are becoming more fibrotic, and they're having a really hard time expanding as a consequence. That could be due to like scar tissue uh, in, their, in the interstitium, um, and all that scar tissue is going to cause fibrosis. Generally speaking, we don't really know why it happens. It's going to be an idiopathic condition. It could also be associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome, as well as tuberculosis. 
Um, it could be involved in uh, pneumoconiosis. So we're going to talk about uh, black lung a little bit later with coal miners and uh, like you know, work-related uh, damage to the lungs. So different toxins and things like that could also cause pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it could also be autoimmune, so cystic fibrosis, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Sarcoidosis, SLE, which is lupus. Those are all things that could potentially cause pulmonary fibrosis. And so generally speaking, it's going to be more common in men. Older individuals usually get this. But it's going to be inflammation, right? It's going to be inflammatory mediated. So you have fibroproliferation as a consequence of all that inflammation. Uh, reduced compliance. Difficulty breathing because you have a hard time getting air into the lungs. So you're going to reduce your tidal volume. It's going to be blunted. Hypoventilation, hypercapnia, right? Carbon dioxide is going to accumulate within your uh, serum and your blood. Uh, so you're going to get dyspnea, and uh, you can diagnose this with CT scans. You can see the changes on CT. You could do a lung biopsy. You could also do a pulmonary function test as well to be able to diagnose uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So uh, let's do one question from this, and I want to continue on with the rest of pulmonary. So let's go ahead and log in. Uh, I discovered through one of the students in this class that if I don't let you guys start the quizzes in class, that I have to like assign the quizzes to you. So let's start this one in class. You do like one question, but do the rest of the questions later on your own time. Because unfortunately, we have a lot of ground to cover. We have later on. I want to get into GI and all that stuff too. So, oh, participants here. So go ahead and log in. Twenty of us in here. All right, let's go ahead and start. Just one question, and we'll move on afterwards. So the key uh, takeaways from this question, part of the vignette, hyperinflation of the lungs, and then the last little section there that says cyanosis and clubbing absent. You would see cyanosis and clubbing in, oh my God. <laughs> I need to fix this question. So I'm going to fix this question. Let me make a note of that real quick here. Should be emphysema for this vignette. What's up? It works, yeah, but I don't like the way that quite the way that I wrote that question was misleading. So let me fix that so you guys can go back to that on your own time later on. So I'll review these questions and make sure that they're going to be up to par uh, when you go into them later on. So let's put an end to this so we can continue on. All right. I got a little bit of review to do for today. All right, core pulmonale. With core pulmonale, um, this is where you have, over time, when the lungs are being affected by whatever, like edema, pulmonary edema, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, all that, over time, is going to start affecting the right side of the heart. So with core pulmonale, 
That's where you get thickening of the walls of the right side of the heart. You get right side heart failure. And um, that's going to cause all sorts of things like edema, right, peripherally. You're going to get peripheral edema. You're going to also see fluid built up in the uh, peritoneal cavity, so you get ascites. And then JVD, jugular venous distension. So you really shouldn't see the jugular vein pulsating, but if you have the patient laid down, you can have them laid down at like a 45 degree angle, and then you look at their neck, and if you see their uh, jugular vein pulsating, then that's uh, jugular venous distension. You can also exacerbate that by like pressing on their liver, which like pushes blood more towards the uh, superior vena cava, and so you're gonna see uh, excessive amounts of pulsation at the, at the jugular vein. You can uh, do a chest x-ray to see what's going on with their lungs. EKG, echo, cardiography would, or cardiogram would help to uh, see what's going on with the heart. And then you can also do a pulmonary function test as well. So that is poor pulmonale. Now, pneumoconiosis. This is where you have lung damage because of things that you've inhaled. So it could be all sorts of different types of particles. Silicosis is where you are breathing in lots of silica. And silica is going to be something you find in like quartz. Uh, you also find it in construction sites, places like that. It's one of the like OG lung diseases, right? Silicosis. Asbestosis is associated with asbestos, right? We don't really use as much asbestos nowadays, but back in the day, a lot of buildings used to be built with a lot of asbestos for insulation. If you have asbestos accumulated in your lungs, that's really, really dangerous. That can cause mesothelioma. Is there a link here? No, not a link there. So that can cause mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is a type of lung cancer, so that is not a good situation. And then this is where you get coal miner lung, so black lung, so it's called coal workers pneumoconiosis. The colloquial term for that is black lung. And the lungs literally look black when a person develops black lung. Um, there's a lot of really great documentaries and a lot of really great books that talk about this. George Orwell wrote a really wonderful book called The Road to Wigan Pier, and it talks about like the working class, especially the working class that had to do a lot of coal mining. And he like he does a really like full-on investigation of all the coal miners, and it's really awesome. It's a great read. Uh, and he, you know, he's a really wonderful author in general. Beyond just 1984 and Animal Farm, uh, Road to Wigan Pier is really great. So he talks a little bit about the health complications for these patients, or for, not patients, for these people that were like working in coal mines. Lots of health, com health complications. Those folks generally tend to live very short lives. So it's extremely sad, um, especially during the Industrial Revolution and the 19th century where coal was really, really important to uh, the fuel industry. Signs and symptoms, you get reduced compliance, shortness of breath, clubbing, chest pain, all that stuff. You can do a chest x-ray, you can do a pulmonary function test, you can do a bronchoscope, right? So you can take uh, uh, a scope and look down into their lungs and see what's going on. So that's pneumoconiosis. Cystic fibrosis, now this is different. This is a genetic disease. So this is a genetic mutation of the CFTR gene. The CFTR gene is really important for chloride movement. So it's going to affect chloride channels. Now, a lot of people, huh, a lot of people are carriers. So I included Dr. Jackson in here because uh, Dr. Jackson and his wife, um, Dr. Jackson is uh, Ashkenazi Jew. And there's a lot of uh, genetic disorders that are going to be linked to Ashkenazi Jews. And so very often when Ashkenazi Jews like, you know, get married and they want to decide on whether to have children, they also want to be aware of whether or not they're going to be predisposed to certain types of genetic conditions. So there's lots of different, like Tay-Sachs disease, there's lots of like different genetic diseases that are associated with certain demographics. And so Dr. Jackson actually took a uh, genetics test uh, it turns out that he's a carrier of the CFTR gene. His wife is not. His wife is actually not a carrier. So if they were to have children, which they're not planning on it, <laughs> they uh, wouldn't have any issues with cystic fibrosis. But lots of people are carriers of the CFTR gene. So if you're a carrier and you're marrying into somebody that 
is also a carrier, that's going to increase the risk that your child might uh, uh, develop cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a really nasty disease. Um, back in the day, individuals used to live very short lives. Like they would, they would max out at about 30 years. However, nowadays they have really good treatments that can actually help these individuals live much longer lives. So you can see lifespans going beyond 50 years nowadays. So it's actually really great. But what does the CFTR gene do? It's going to be affecting your lungs. It's also going to be affecting your pancreas. Um, and those are the major areas that you're going to see. But there's other areas in your body that get affected too. So one of the tests that you can do, you can see how much salt is on the person's skin because the CFTR gene is going to affect the, the way that, salt, um, that, that sweat is produced because chloride ions are going to be really important in that process. So let's watch a little video on cystic fibrosis. A patient with cystic fibrosis is susceptible to infections of the lungs. This is due to a mutation that affects a protein on the surface of lung cells. Many different mutations can cause cystic fibrosis, but all of them involve a transmembrane protein called CFTR that functions as a channel for chloride move in and out of cells. In this case, CFTR is less able to transfer chloride ions out of the cell compared to the functioning protein in people without cystic fibrosis. The channel is, in effect, locked shut. This inability to transfer chloride ions has an effect on the outside of the cell. In people without cystic fibrosis, there is a balance of chloride ions inside and outside lung cells, which maintains the right amount of water and salt ions in the mucus lining the airway cell. Cilia normally sweep the water and mucus from the lung lining, keeping the surface clean. In patients with cystic fibrosis, chloride ions concentrate inside cells and draw in water by osmosis. With less water, the mucus becomes thicker and cilia can't move. Flow is reduced providing an environment for bacterial infection. But there are now drugs that can help patients. To find the drug, researchers tested over 200,000 small molecules to see if any would bind to the CFTR protein. Then, for each small molecule that had some binding ability, researchers chemically synthesized different variations of that molecule and tested them for the ability to improve the function of some types of mutant CFTR channels. They identified a drug that, when taken by patients with a certain type of CFTR mutation, binds to the CFTR protein, opening the channel, and allowing improved ion transfer. This increases chloride ion flow and maintains a watery, clear mucus, which helps the cilia move more freely and reduces the risk of bacterial infection. All right, cool. So let's look further into some of the pathophysiology behind this. So <clears throat> signs and symptoms, uh, you're going to see very salty skin. Sometimes the parent, right, they have like, their baby, you know, they, parents like to kiss their baby. Sometimes they'll notice that the skin tastes really, really salty, more so than normal. Um, also, you're going to see effects on the pancreas. So you're going to see GI effects as well. So you're going to get loose oily stools, right? Because if the pancreas can't release things like lipase, protease, amylase properly, you're not going to be able to break down, for instance, like lipids with lipase, right? So your stools are going to be very oily as a consequence. Um, because the lungs are going to be affected, you have very thick accumulation of mucus in the lungs, you're going to be a high risk for pneumonia, specifically Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That's like the major bacteria that can cause uh, pneumonia in patients with cystic fibrosis. They're going to get clubbing over time, barrel chest over time, and then failure to thrive as a consequence. Let me see if this video is different than the other one that we just watched. Oh, it's the same video. Okay, let's move on. So here is the sweat gland. So with normal sweat glands, uh, sodium chloride can be reabsorbed into the, in, uh, into the gland. And so when you're sweating, you don't want the sweat to be like super, super concentrated. You want it to be pretty watery, right? And you can evaporate and let you cool down a little bit. But if chloride ions can't be reabsorbed, then chloride ions are going to stay 
on the outside of the uh, cell, and so you're going to have lots of sodium chloride building up on the outside of the sweat gland. Right? So you're going to have very salty skin, salty sweat. What's going on with the pancreas? Uh, you're going to start seeing plugs within the pancreatic ducts, and so you're going to get uh, issues with, like, for example, lipase. Right? So you're going to have fat malabsorption, and because of that, you're going to see weakness, wasting away, because you need fats in your diet, right? But you're going to be just dumping all of that, uh, unfortunately, through the stool. Um, what's going on with the lungs? And so in order for your uh, mucus to be produced properly, you need to have a properly functioning chloride channel. And if you don't have a properly functioning chlor chloride channel, then you're going to get uh, dehydration of the mucus. So the mucus is going to be very, very thick, right? Because you're not going to be able to reabsorb the water from the mucus, right? So you're going to be seeing lots of sodium chloride within the mucus. Water follows solutes, so it's going to stay within the. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you're going to try to. Sorry, you're going to try to reduce the amount of sodium chloride in the mucus so you can get the water out. So you see very, very thick mucus being produced. Thick mucus is going to impair cilia then you're going to get a lot of bacterial infections as a consequence. So that's the major uh, mechanism involved in mucus production and cystic fibrosis. So how do you test it? You can actually do a sweat test for patients with uh, CF. Um, you can also do genetics testing to see if they have the gene uh, for the CFTR gene uh, mutation. So those are all different things you can do with cystic fibrosis. So any questions on cystic fibrosis? All right, cool. So let's now talk about pneumonia. We already talked about bronchitis earlier, but now let's talk about pneumonia. So bronchitis, remember, it's mostly going to be viral. Pneumonia, on the other hand, is going to be mostly bacterial. You, you can see viral pneumonia. You can see chemical pneumonia. You can see other types of pneumonia. But generally speaking, it's going to be a bacterial infection, and that's usually the one that kills the patient. All right, so it's going to be your, one of your... Uh, classic lower respiratory tract infections, very deadly. Lots of people die from pneumonia annually. Um, <clears throat> like I said, bacterial viruses, you can also get fungi. And then this is the alphabet soup of pneumonia. I'm not going to make you remember every single one of these, but CAP is community acquired pneumonia. That means like, you know, if you and I in this class were to develop pneumonia, we would be getting CAP. That's community acquired pneumonia. If you're in the hospital for 48 hours and you develop pneumonia in the hospital, that's hospital-acquired pneumonia, H-A-P. There is also healthcare-associated pneumonia. Then there's ventilator-associated pneumonia. Ventilator, why? Because they're intubated, they're going to aspirate more frequently. So they're going to aspirate, they'll get an aspiration pneumonia. Sometimes they get even chemical pneumonia from the hydrochloric acid in and of itself. Um, mostly, um, the pneumonia, the number one cause of pneumonia is going to be streptococcus pneumoniae, but there's lots of different bacteria that can cause pneumonia. Um, one really nasty one is going to be this guy right here. So Klebsiella pneumoniae is pretty bad. I refer to it as getting drunk in the club because it's often associated with alcoholics, but it's also associated with aspiration too, right? If an alcoholic drinks too much booze, right, sometimes they puke and they, you know, goes down the wrong Right, that's what happened to a lot of famous people. Happened to uh, Bon Scott from ACDC. Happened to Jimi Hendrix. Happened to lots of famous people. You know, they party too hard, they puke, they suffocate on their vomit. If you if you don't suffocate on the vomit, and you get bacteria in there, then you have a high risk of developing bacterial pneumonia like Klebsiella. Klebsiella looks a lot like Streptococcus pneumoniae. It presents very similar. You get the uh, High fever, you get the productive cough, you get dyspnea, you get uh, pleuritis, which is pain inflammation of the pleura. Um, but Klebsiella is particularly nasty because often it requires surgical intervention. Sometimes you start getting abscess formation and you have to get those surgically drained. So Klebsiella is a really nasty bug. Um, you get lots of consolidation. So if you were to look at a person's uh, x-ray, radiograph, you're going to see lots of consolidations. Uh, in the chest radiograph, that's going to re result in dyspnea. You also get low VQ mismatch, right? You're not able to ventilate properly. You're getting perfusion, but the ventilation is not working too well. 
These are at-risk people, immunocompromised, um, you, have, you have chronic disease, uh, nosocomial infections are also going to be a high risk for that. These are all uh, the signs and symptoms. So dyspnea, fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, tachypnea, right? If you're hypo hypoxic, you're going to try to breathe fast. Tachycardic, if you're, your heart's going to try to beat rapidly to try to get as much oxygen as possible delivered to tissues. Um, you will hear crackles on a lung exam. You'll, if you were to tap on the person's lung, it's going to be very dull because of all the fluid accumulation. So it's going to be dullness on percussion, chest radiograph, you can see consolidations. You can actually see entire lobes being involved, and that's called a lobar pneumonia if an entire lobe is involved. Leukocytosis on CBC, and of course you can do a blood or sputum culture. You really want to treat this person with antibiotics. Um, the main antibiotics are going to be like vancomycin, ceft uh, cephalosporins like ceftriaxone, um, as well as ampicillin. You want to aggressively treat these patients because pneumonia can kill. And if it's strep pneumonia, strep pneumo, that can get into the CSF, right? And if it does that, that can turn into meningitis. So that's a huge concern for bacterial meningitis because strep pneumo, number one cause of pneumonia, strep pneumo, number one cause of bacterial meningitis. So that's why it's really scary when a person has bacterial pneumonia. If it's viral, nah, you can't really treat it. There's not much you can do. That's, you just do supportive care, and that's about it. All right, tuberculosis versus pneumonia. So pneumonia, you get like all these different things, right? You get fever. You get issues with, you know, you get altered mental status sometimes, chills, all that stuff. You're going to get a productive cough. Sometimes it's going to be bloody. You might see blood tinge sputum. Versus tuberculosis, you're going to get like full-on hemoptysis. You're going to be coughing up blood. Uh, you're also going to get night sweats, so it's kind of paroxysmal. It's going to be mostly in the night. Um, chronic cough or tuberculosis over three weeks. They're also going to lose weight. That's some of the biggest hallmarks with tuberculosis. If you see a person who has a chronic cough for over three weeks, if they're losing weight unintentionally, and if they have blood in their sputum, you're like, that's got to be tuberculosis. It could be cancer, too. So you want to rule out cancer, but could be tuberculosis. Those are some of the hallmarks of tuberculosis. What causes tuberculosis? It's a bacteria, mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is an acid-fast bacteria. Who here has taken microbiology? Oh, good. So the majority of you guys took micro. That's great. So acid-fast, um, what's, uh, what's going to be the thing that you find in their cell wall? Huh? Lipopolysaccharides. <laughs> so mycobacterium in general is going to be a little bit different than a lot of your other bacteria. That's why it's an acid-fast bacteria. It has mycolic acid within the cell wall. And mycolic acid is kind of like a waxy type of cell wall layer. And because it's waxy, it's really resistant to a lot of antibiotics. You can't treat it with penicillin. You can't treat it with like your standard, typical run-of-the-mill antibiotics. You have to give the person a four-drug cocktail, especially if it's active TB. And those four drugs, you have to give it to the person for six to 24 months. That's how hard it is to treat uh, microbacterium uh, organisms. So when you guys were doing your uh, bacterial staining in the lab, right, you did acid-fast staining. It's a different procedure than you, when you're doing gram staining, right? So when you're doing acid fasting, you're using carbofusion, which is like a pretty nasty compound. And so you stain it red, so it's kind of like red like that, kind of fuchsia color, very pretty. And then you counter stain with methylene blue so you can see everything else. But acid fast organisms are really tough to treat. So tuberculosis, a nasty bug. And guess what? It is one of the worst infections in the world still to this day. 13th leading cause of death in the world. That's really high. That's really, really high. Um, we don't really see it much here in the United States, not as common. You're mostly seeing it in like areas that are overcrowded, congested, maybe have really poor sanitation, maybe poor infrastructure. So you see it in like really big cities, especially in like Eastern countries, places like that. Um, when I was living in London, there was also tuberculosis in London because think about the subway tubes, the tubes, the underground, the London underground, everyone's just like tight, confined spaces. 
there's people from all over the world visiting London, right? So it's very metropolitan, so you get lots of people from different parts of the world. And so tuberculosis was also a concern when I was living out there in London as well. So this is all fun facts from this um, World Health Organization. I'm not going to go through all those. But tuberculosis, what is it? It's airborne, and it's a chronic disease. Um, some people get latent TB. Latent TB is different. Latent TB, you can treat it with one drug, and that's usually all you need. Latent TB, it's not active. Once it becomes active, that's when the person starts getting all those like other symptoms, productive cough, weight loss, etc. Night sweats, bloody sputum. How do you uh, diagnose it? You can do a couple things. You can do the Mantox, uh, or you can do a PPD. The PPD is where you get a subcutaneous injection, right? And then you wait like two days. And if you see the size of that site increase, that means you're getting a reaction. You have antibodies against it. Now, you can get false positives if you were previously diagnosed with tuberculosis. I had a colleague when I went to med school, and she was from India, and she had tuberculosis when she was a kid. And so she always had to tell the people, like, yeah, by the way, you're giving me this PPD. It's going to come back positive because I had TB before. And so there's other tests that you can do, too, um, that can help to rule out uh, tuberculosis. But that's going to be one of the easiest ones, especially here in the West where very few of us have been exposed to TB uh, previously. So it used to be called consumption because it would literally consume the person. It would make them completely waste away. They'd become cachectic, they'd be uh, coughing up blood. So it was pretty nasty. And uh, back in the day, they used to treat these patients. They would put them off into sanatoriums, right? Um, especially in places like the Southwest. There's, uh, if you go to Sunny Slope, Sunny Slope over here back in the day when Sunny Slope was like first founded, that was kind of like a tuberculosis sanitarium. Lots of people would come here from the East Coast to get away from like, you know, cold weather, as well as like humidity, and they would come here to Arizona because of the dry air, and it was a little bit warmer, so it actually would help patients with tuberculosis. But it used to be called consumption. Lots of famous people, especially authors, writers, English poets. Um, yeah, lots of people have died from tuberculosis. Uh, lots of people die still to this day from tuberculosis. And uh, what, what are the risk factors? Living in crowded areas, poverty, homelessness, substance abuse. If you're immunocompromised, that's going to predispose you to tuberculosis. If you've traveled recently to a developing nation, that's another predisposing factor to TB. If you have latent TB, you have no symptoms. You just have it, but it's not actually doing anything. When you have active TB, that's where you have the cough for three weeks, hemoptysis, then weight loss, huge, right, is weight loss, red flag. But note, you can also get other areas affected. It's not just the lungs. Now, when I was living in London, one of the coolest things that I saw out there, this is a bunch of wonderful museums. Um, there's also like the, really the, the best one is the Natural History Museum where you have like the Hall of Enlightenment. It's like where they have like Charles Darwin and all of like the explorers from like back in the 1700s, 1800s, all the stuff that they found from around the world. It's really neat. But if you ever get a chance to go to London, go to the Royal College of Surgeons and they have a museum that you can go to. It's a huge museum. And like they have this entire wall that's just like all skulls, just skulls. And they're all marked with dates and where they got them from. Um, then if you go to the second floor, you see stuff like this. You see spinal columns, vertebral columns that are completely deformed because of tuberculosis. You also see other bones from the patients, the people's bodies that were completely deformed because of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis used to be really nasty, and it still is. If you Google search vertebral column tuberculosis, you'll see pictures from nowadays from places like in Africa and in India, parts of Asia, where kids, like little kids, will, have, will be walking around with a spine that's completely deformed at like a 90-degree angle. So it's still causing lots of chaos to people around the world who can't afford good health care, get access to the drugs that they need to get treated. And also, if you guys remember, going back to our week one, when we talked about different types of necrosis, you get caseous necrosis, so it looks like cheese. Not the kind of cheese that I would like to eat, but I don't know it's with doctors naming stuff after food. It's so gross. But <laughs> Anyways, tuberculosis, active TB, that's where you get all the symptoms. You get blood, uh, hemoptysis, fevers, chills, night sweats, weight loss. It can affect other organs as well. <clears throat> You get granulomas in your lungs. 
Um, granulomas are going to be associated with uh, macrophages. Macrophages are going to come in. They're going to gobble up the tuberculosis. They're not going to die, but they're going to form these granulomas. And uh, they start to uh, multiply within those granulomas. You start getting scar tissue formed as well. Um, and they could remain dormant. That's where you get latent TB. But then if it becomes active, that's when you get all the other stuff happening. Hemoptysis, weight loss, etc. So again, here's a test that you can do. PPD test. Um, <clears throat> you can also do a blood test too. So here's the interferon gamma release assay. assay. This is uh, becoming a better test nowadays. It's kind of like uh, better than the PPD because it's way more specific, right? It shows that the person has like active TB. Um, you can also do chest x-ray and then you can do culturing. Um, there is a vaccine, so that's the BCG vaccine. Who here has had the BCG vaccine? Did you get it when you were in Mexico? You had the scar? I have the scar too. Uh-huh. Yeah, so most of you guys probably have not had it before, right? When I was a kid, I was living in Saudi Arabia. My dad was working in Saudi Arabia. And so I do have the BCG vaccine. And it's, you know, it leaves a little ugly scar on your arm. I still have it to this day. I was looking at it and uh, my mom has it. I think my dad has it too. So we all have it because we're all a bunch of foreigners. <laughs> so uh, y'all Americans over here are not going to have the BCG vaccine. It's mostly common for people from abroad. So I'm not going to reiterate everything that you see with TB, but this is what you do with drug uh, uh, to treat TB. So you're going to use a four-drug cocktail. These drugs are really brutal when it comes to the side effects. So you have isoniazid, rifampin, uh, perizinamide, and ethambutol. So you have to give these drugs for 6 to 24 months. So generally speaking, you have to do it under medical guidance and supervision because guess what? The side effects are so bad that the patient would rather deal with tuberculosis than deal with the side effects. And so noncompliance is really huge when it comes to tuberculosis treatment. Like, Look at all the side effects. Ethambutol, it messes with your eyes. It can cause optic neuritis. Um, hepatotoxicity, nephrotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, lots of really nasty side effects. So people do not want to take these drugs. And by the way, don't memorize all the side effects for these drugs. Just know that the side effects are pretty, pretty nasty. All right, so we are at 1241. Let's go through coccidiomycosis real quick. So coccidiomycosis, this is, if you lived in Arizona, you are very familiar with valley fever, right? Does anybody in here have any pets that have had valley fever? You have? They, are they okay? You know, sometimes pe people's pe pets will die from valley fever. Um, I've had friends that have had valley fever, and it can cause permanent scarring of the tissues in the lungs that are affected. Pets can get it. And how do you get it? You get it, huh? Dirt. Yeah, exactly. So here in Southwest, we get monsoons. The rain is usually preceded by a haboob, which is the greatest word in the English language. <laughs> so a dust storm comes in, blows up all this these spores from the soil, and you breathe it in, right? You breathe in the coccidioides immatis spore, and then it gets into your lungs, and that's how you get valley fever. Most of us have been exposed to valley fever if we grew up here. I moved here when I was three years old, and so I've definitely been exposed to it in the past. So I probably have antibodies against it. Most people that move here from other states have not been exposed to it, and they are at a higher risk of developing valley fever because they don't have the antibodies against it. So new transplants to the southwest can tend to have a higher risk of getting this. So notice the map distribution right here. We're in the hotbed of it, right? Arizona. You also get in parts of California, uh, parts of Mexico, parts of New Mexico, parts of Texas. So what are you going to see with uh, coccidia mycosis? When you hear mycosis, that's a fungal infection. So if you hear of mycosis, that's fungus. So you get all the flu-like symptoms, fevers, chills, night sweats, shortness of breath. You also get erythema nudosum, which is where you get these like little painful nodules on your legs. Um, it doesn't only affect your lungs. It can actually become disseminated. 
And that's really dangerous because it can really can cause some serious damage to the rest of your body. So disseminated coccidomycosis, very dangerous. How do you treat it? It's a fungal infection. You can just give them antifungals. So like amphotericin B, itraconazole, fluconazole, those types of drugs would be effective against coccidiomycosis. This is your erythema nudosum. You get all these little red spots around the legs. So that would be consistent with uh, valley fever. But there's other things that can cause uh, erythema nudosum too. So it's not just valley fever. It just can sometimes coincide with valley fever. And this is a little uh, radiograph with a lung that has some scarring due to coccidiomycosis. And that's it. Let's uh, continue on bronchiectasis when we meet up again on Friday. We'll wrap up respiratory. So have a great day, guys. So for today, we're going to finish up respiratory, where we left off last time. And then we're going to begin part one of GI. Over Thanksgiving break, I'm going to post part two of GI. So I want you guys to like review it, part two of GI, as well as genetics. So I want you to review those on your own. Genetics is pretty easy. I'm not going to, it's pretty straightforward. There's only like a handful of diseases that I'm going to make you guys be familiar with. But part two GI, it's going to deal with a lot of like liver disorders, things like that, which are also pretty straightforward. So nothing really too tough. So it'll be uh, some light reading, some light studying for you over Thanksgiving break. Um, then when you get back from Thanksgiving break on Wednesday, we're going to do like a big crash review of all the stuff that's going to be on your exam on that Friday. So we'll do all that the week after Thanksgiving. Um, any questions so far on respiratory? So cool. Let's finish out respiratory. So last time we were talking about coccidiomycosis. Right? So coccidiomycosis, that's going to be a very common fungal infection that you'll see here in Phoenix, Arizona. You'll see it in the southwest. Another name for uh, coccidiomycosis Aside from uh, valley fever, it's also referred to as San Joaquin Valley Fever. That's another term for it as well. And as I mentioned before, it's, you know, it can cause some severe damage to the lungs. So it can actually cause some serious scarring. Uh, if it's bad enough and it becomes disseminated throughout the body, it could potentially kill a person as well. So coccidiomycosis, valley fever, not something to be taken too lightly because it can result in permanent damage to the lungs. So, speaking of damage to the lungs, let's talk a little bit about bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis is where you're going to see infections that result in inflammation and then destruction and then dilation of the bronchi. And so bronchiectasis, you're going to get widening of the bronchi. And when they're widened up, they're also going to be filled up with things like mucus, um, and you're going to get all sorts of infections. Foreign bodies as well can cause this, right? Um, <clears throat> effectively, what you're getting is elastin destruction. So it's kind of similar to what you see with emphysema, so except emphysema is going to be pr predominantly affecting the alveoli. Right? If you get elastin destruction with emphysema, you get air trapping and whatnot, the alveoli are going to be basically permanently dilated. Same situation with bronchiectasis. If you're, bra if you're breaking down elastin, then you're going to get dilation of the bronchi, and it's going to be permanent. Right? So you're not going to be able to reverse that. Um, you're going to see cough, right, infections, chronic cough, productive cough, so you're going to have sputum. You, you might see blood, hemoptysis, and then you're going to see cyanosis and clubbing as well. And you could see hypercapnia with this, right, because you're not able to breathe off all the carbon dioxide. You could see hypoxemia. Uh, and then you could also visualize some of those changes on a CT scan, which I'm not going to test you guys on, but you could potentially see that on a CT scan. Now, compare that with atelectasis. Atelectasis is a little bit different. That's where you have collapsing of lungs and tissues associated with the lungs. Um, what is the cause of atelectasis? So usually it's going to be uh, associated with anesthesia. So it's going to be a complication of anesthesia. It's generally going to be post-surgical. Now, if you have compression atelectasis, uh, this is where you're starting to get air entering into the pleural space. Now, you remember that the pleural space is supposed to be not much, right? You're supposed to, it's supposed to be negative pressure 
in the pleural space, you need to have a little bit of serous fluid in there to allow for lubrication of the lungs so that you don't get any friction damage when you're breathing in and breathing out. Now, if you get air in there or if you get other stuff in there too, like fluids or blood, like a hemothorax, um, all those are going to result in compression atelectasis. So what's happening, you're compressing the lungs, right? So the lungs are going to collapse and that space is going to be either filled up with air or that space is going to be filled up with fluid. So if it's a pleural effusion, that's fluid. If it's a hemothorax, that's blood, right? So different things could theoretically fill in that uh, space, whether it's air, blood, or just fluids. Um, absorption atelectasis is a little bit different. Um, this is the one that's going to be predominantly associated with anesthesia, but you're going to get things like mucus plugs. You're going to get foreign bodies, narrowing of the airway. So this is going to be obstructive, right? So it's absorption slash obstructive atelectasis. Now, this is an example of a pneumothorax. So if you look at a person's chest radiograph and, it's, and it looks nice and clear, right? That means there's nothing there, right? So that means that the person's lung collapsed. And then what's this structure right here? Yeah, that's, that's the trachea, right? So the trachea and everything else is going to shift over to the opposite side of the pneumothorax, right? So we call that like a mediastinal shift. It's going to shift over. And so everything basically shifts over. And it's not good, right, because you're going to have a collapsed lung. You're not going to be able to breathe properly. So you want to be able to correct for that. Uh, you might need to put a chest tube in that person so you can allow the lung to go back into place. What's up? Why don't they just drain the air? it might not just be air, it could be also like a hemothorax or because it could be blood filled too, right? So if it's blood filled, I mean, I guess you could do something different because with a chest tube, you're going to be trying to create like the vacuum, right? You're going to try to recreate that negative pressure. Uh, with a hemothorax, I'd imagine you have to do something a little bit different. I'm not sure exactly what the treatment modality for a hemothorax versus a pneumothorax would be, but, but why would they waste their time doing an x-ray? Right, yeah, you could do a percuss. You could theoretically percuss. You could theoretically do that without an x-ray, but it's good to also cross the I's, sorry, cross the T's and dot the I's and make sure. That's pretty damn significant. That's pretty significant. This person is going to be in severe respiratory distress. <laughs> Why would they waste their time doing an x-ray? Well, x-rays are really fast. You can even have like a mobile x-ray, right? You can bring an x-ray to the patient's bed in the ER if you had to. Right? There's... You're just thinking that they should go directly into getting a chest tube, get this thing fixed right away. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. You also want to just do x-rays just to see what else might be going on in there, too. So don't ask me why that's the protocol, but... <laughs> But I'll, I know that with pneumothorax, you can get different types of pneumothorax, which we're going to go into in a second. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure exactly how concentrated O2 causes this, but things happen. Look it up and find out. <laughs> Let me know if you find anything. <laughs> All right, so uh, here are some other causes, right? So you got your uh, obstructive or absorption atelectasis. You can also get impairment with surfactant, and that's what you see with preemies, right? So if you see a preemie, a premature baby is not going to be able to produce surfactant on their own. If they're not able to do that, that's going to reduce, uh, sorry, that's going to increase the amount of surface tension. And it's going to make the lungs collapse. So surfactant is there. It's like a soapy type of oily substance right, that's going to be produced by your type 2 pneumocytes to be able to reduce surface tension, increase compliance. If you can't produce surfactant, then you're going to get the opposite, right? And so you're going to get uh, neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. So this is something that you see with children. So that's why you need to give preemies and neonates that aren't able to produce surfactant on their own, you need to give them exogenous surfactant to be able to overcome that. Uh, what are you going to see with atelectasis? Shortness of breath, obviously. Chest pain, obviously. 
the person might be coughing as well. Um, huge risk for pneumonia. Lots of things that affect the lungs can secondarily cause a pneumonia. So, for example, if a person has broken ribs, if a person breaks their ribs, they're going to have to get respiratory physiologist and a respiratory therapist to come in and help the person breathe. Because when you have a broken rib, you're going to have a hard time breathing. And if you have a hard time breathing, stuff become, be, begins to pool in the lungs, including bacteria, right? And so that becomes like a breeding ground for infection. So you can get pneumonia secondary to things like atelectasis, pneumothorax, even broken ribs, right? Anything that makes it difficult to breathe can lay the ground, groundwork for a pneumonia-type infection. And then testing, chest uh, x-ray and CT scan. So pneumothorax. <clears throat> this is where you get air within that pleural space. Uh, this can happen secondary to trauma, like maybe you had a stab wound to the chest, for example. Or it could just happen spontaneously. There's a friend of mine. He had this happen to him spontaneously. So what are the, some of the risk factors for a spontaneous pneumothorax? Being really tall and being really thin. My buddy fits both of those. He's very tall, he's very thin, and then just randomly, spontaneous pneumothorax. So pretty, pretty nasty situation. Um, and so if you have a closed pneumothorax, that could be due to a ruptured uh, bleb. So the interpleural pressure is going to be less than the uh, atmospheric pressure. That's going to be within a closed pneumothorax. So your interpleural pressure is still going to be a vacuum, okay? Open pneumothorax is where you have an opening. This could be a stab wound, for example, right? So your interpleural pressure is going to be the same as the atmospheric pressure, right? So it's supposed to be a vacuum. So what's going to happen? You're going to get a sucking chest wound, right? And so air is going to just enter into the interpleural space, and then eventually it's going to equal itself out. So you're going to have equal pressure within the, inter, uh, the pleural space as well as the atmospheric pressure. And then a tension pneumothorax, this is where you get basically like a one-way valve type scenario. Um, and then air is going to, so your interpleural space now is going to be greater than the atmospheric uh, pressure and air is going to enter in during inspiration. So every time you take a breath in, you're going to start getting air entering in further and further and further. So it becomes a perpetual cycle. So <laughs> that's not a good situation. So this over here would be the tension pneumothorax. So you keep on getting air within the interpleural space. What are the symptoms? You're going to get dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing, tachypnea, the heart rate's going to start accelerating obviously chest pain. Uh, breath sounds are going to be decreased in the areas that are affected. And then percussion, right? So if you percuss that area, you're going to get hyper resonance. And then uh, you'll see deviation of your trachea. Uh, if it's a tension pneumothorax, that deviation is going to be away from the affected area. So this over here is a tension pneumothorax. You got your empty space over here. Tracheal deviation is going to be in the opposite direction. And then you can diagnose that with chest x-ray if you wanted to, which you should, Trent. <laughs> so you diagnose it with a chest x-ray, and then you put in a chest tube so you can help to uh, correct the issue, bring that, bring that interpleural uh, space back to a negative pressure. All right, so let's talk about respiratory distress uh, versus respiratory failure. So with distress, you're going to have a hard time oxygenation with oxygenation uh, versus failure, you're not going to be able to get any compensatory mechanisms to come into place to correct the issue. And so we'll go into uh, the, different, uh, the differences between those two. So here you've got acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, or ARDS. Um, you're not going to get proper gas exchange. So you have inadequate gas exchange. Um, this could be due to an infection, right? So you get lots of fluid starting to accumulate within the lungs. So it's making it really hard to be able to breathe and get gas exchange, right? Uh, you're going to get hypoxemia as a consequence. Obviously, you're not getting good gas exchange. But you're going to get some compensatory mechanisms kicking in 
including respiratory rates, are going to become tachypnic to be able to overcome this. And your heart rate is also going to go up. So you're going to become tachycardic. And this is the main cause. It's going to be sepsis. Right? It could be pneumonia, trauma as well, aspiration. Uh, this is what you would see with a lot of patients that had like really severe COVID-19, severe cases of flu as well. Um, and then this is the final stage, would be acute respiratory failure. Now, this is where the body is not able to compensate properly, right? So your respiratory rate is going to be really high. Uh, you're not going to get a good tidal volume if you're breathing really, really rapidly. Then all of a sudden, now your heart rate starts to tank, your blood pressure starts to tank, you're going to become acidotic, hypoxemic, you're going to be hypercapnic, and then eventually this could result in multiple organ uh, failure, right? So you're going to get MODS, so multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. So that's end-stage respiratory distress, right? So you got acute respiratory distress, which eventually will turn into acute respiratory failure if left untreated. So what's going on here? You have inflammation, you got permeability, that's you got increased capillary permeability, which results in pulmonary edema, lots of fluid accumulation. The edema results in low carbon dioxide, or sorry, low oxygenation. You're going to have hypoxemia, um, and then you're going to see com compensation. Tachycardia, you're also going to uh, see increased respiratory rate. So in other words, you're trying to uh, correct for the VQ mismatch. Um, <clears throat> but you're still going to be acidotic, right? Whenever you're hypercapnic and you're not getting enough oxygen as well, you're going to start becoming acidotic. So how do you test this? You do ABGs, arterial blood gas. Has anybody in here ever taken an ABG on a patient before? So you go into the radial artery, and then you take a needle, and you go straight in. It's at a 90-degree angle to the skin, and you have to go really deep in there, and it hurts a lot. The patients do not enjoy that because, remember, think, Think like veins are going to be more superficial. Arteries are going to be way deeper. And so if you're going into the radial artery, you have to go really deep. And then you get the blood sample from the artery. You take that off, and that's how you get your ABGs, arterial blood gas. And then you're going to see hypoxemia in there. You can also do a chest x-ray. This is what the chest x-ray is going to look like. You just have infiltrates all over the place, right? So it's going to be all looking super white. So you got white out lungs. Um, you can do cultures if it's an infection, right? So you can see what kind of organis organism it is that's causing this. So you can try to treat them with antibiotics right away. You want to give them oxygen. You want to do other supportive treatments as well. You want to prevent the infection from getting any worse. And if, if it gets really bad, you want to intubate and do mechanical ventilation on that patient. And so these are all the signs and symptoms of ARDS, ARDS. And these are all the different causes, right? It could be trauma, infection. Um, shock, emboli, all that stuff. So let me go ahead and start the quizzes, but I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and complete the quizzes in class because I want to get through as much GI as possible. So let's, let's do one question just so you have access to it over the break. And then you can do those quizzes on your own. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm probably not going to answer any questions over the break. <laughs> I'm sick of you guys. I want some time for myself. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Let me get away from all my students as far away as possible. <laughs> if I see you at the grocery store, I'm going to run the opposite direction. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and begin. One question and one question only.
So this is a pretty good example of a lobar pneumonia. Right? So it's going to be isolated to one lobe. This would be pneumonia. This is not bronchitis. Right? So this is more severe than bronchitis. Generally speaking, bronchitis is not going to really drop your O2 saturation significantly, but this person's O2 saturation is pretty dang low. It was like, what, 90? Yeah, 90%. So that's not great. Um, you would see fever potentially in bronchitis, um, but this other stuff you're really not going to see with bronchitis. Bronchitis sucks, but it's not as bad as pneumonia. Pneumonia is going to have way more severe symptoms. So this is uh, much more in line with a pneumonia. You'll hear like ronchi, right? So those like kind of deep type of sounds, right? Like a more of a significant, it's more significant than a wheeze. You'd see like ronchi. Cool. All right, I'm going to end it there so you can have access to that later on during the break. So let's now go into GI. So give me one second.